All right, looks like we're ready to go. Just a reminder, please stay on mute unless you have a question, as always. And shoot me a uh, message in the chat if you have a question for Bobby. And how about we start with Bob Condota today? Hey, Bobby, how you doing? Um, just uh, what, what what is this first couple days of going through training camp? And obviously, I guess it's completely different than any normal training camp. But what has this first couple of days sort of been like? And, and, you know, I guess just how different is it from what you would normally be doing this time of year? Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a lot different. Um, normally, be in the building, I would be able to be around the guys. Um, obviously, we'd be practicing, things of that nature. So, uh, you know, just having to – basically, we've just been testing. So, um, testing and Zoom calls, kind of similar to what we did in the off season. Um, so, it, a lot of it is just getting understanding about, you know, COVID, uh, getting tested and uh, making sure everybody is uh, being smart and disciplined because we'll have to be to get this thing done. And do you have any S concerns or worries going forward about getting this all done, about this all working out? Um, I'm not concerned. I, mean, I feel like, um, you know, Seahawks have done a great job of trying to provide, you know, a lot of protocols and things of that nature. So I think we're just taking it day at a time. Uh, I'm not really one that uh, thinks about things, uh, you know, what could happen, what ifs, things of that nature. So uh, we just take it a day at a time and see what happens. Thank you. Joe Fan, you have a question? Yep. Uh, Bobby, what's up, man? I'm uh, just curious your thoughts on the Jamal Adams trade. Um, where were you, your reaction? Um, and then maybe on top of that, what he might be able to do for you to make your life a bit easier. Um, very excited for him. Uh, you know, we were, uh, we both have our part of Brand Jordan. So we were, uh, down in Monaco one year and, and was just talking about uh, the possibility of playing together. Um, you know, just I've always admired his game from afar, um, likewise with mine. So I'm excited to have him on the team, excited that um, we were able to kind of get that going. Um, as far as just helping me out, obviously it's another playmaker on the field, another guy that you have to respect. And so, uh, you know, he'll, he'll get a little bit of attention, attention too. Uh, and then I know you haven't had a chance to really interact with them in person, but just maybe first impressions of Jordan Brooks when the linebacker meeting rooms and team meetings. And I don't know if you had any chance to chat with him one-on-one -on -one yet. Yeah, I spoke to him a little bit when we were, uh, when he got drafted, um, you know, been able to be in meetings room with him, but a lot of it is just going over the defense. So he doesn't get to really talk that much. So um, haven't been around him that much. I'm hoping that we, uh, you know, get through this first kind of phase and, and get, get a chance to get around him and, Kind of beyond Genji, I feel like you get to know a person when you when you are next to them and around them, and able to have a conversation. It's kind of hard um, over video. Thanks, man. Corbin Smith. Hi, Bobby. Obviously, the huge trade on Saturday. How surprised were you that the front office went out and, and dealt two first round picks to get Jamal Adams? And how would you compare, contrast him to some of the other stars that you've played with over the years? Um, I mean, I know, you know, John always like to make moves, man. So, um, you know, I think he always does the best he can to, to make sure we have a great team and he's going to make any move that he thinks is possible to, to, to do that. So, uh, you know, I'm excited about it. I think Jamal's an amazing player. Like I said, I've watched him, um, you know, from afar. Uh, he brings a lot of energy, a lot of passion to the game, and I'm excited to have him on our team. Thank you. Greg Bell. Hi, Bobby. As a captain, what message are you giving to younger players and how much is it on players to police themselves to do things like stay at home, stay safe, do things you normally wouldn't have to tell them to do in a season? Um, I think it's extremely important. I think this year is going to be um, a year that we've never experienced for, especially for rookies. The rookies don't even know what to expect going in and it's going to be nothing like any of us has seen before. So I think discipline is going to be the biggest things. Uh, understanding we're not going to be able to do the things that we normally do. Um, and we have to think about um, not just ourselves, but our families, other people's families, and understand, you know, if we do something reckless or do something that, um, you know, going against what we're trying to do, it, it doesn't just affect you and your family. It affects everybody else. So uh, we just got to be really smart about it, um, understand uh, the task at hand, the challenge at hand, and, um, 
you know, really think about others. This is a time to really think about others. What What is your role as a captain in that? Is that your message? Is that the coach? Is it just every player on, on themselves? No, I think it's um, kind of like what you were saying, just uh, players being on top of players, understanding that, you know, letting them know, um, again, it's going to take a lot of discipline to uh, get this done and really being on top of everybody and really just keep pushing that message forward that we're not going to be able to go and do the things that we do. Um, you know, luckily we're kind of in Seattle, so there's not really any clubs or things of that nature that, um, you know, to go out to. But, um, you know, just understanding, like, you need to be more conscious of your, your surroundings. You have to, you know, really be mindful of who you trust as far as what are they doing, you know, outside of the things that they, uh, um, you know, the building. And, you know, you just got to make sure – uh, you have to earn your trust in this situation. You got to make sure you're mindful of the guys around you, mind, mindful of the people that you keep around you and understand what's at stake. There's a lot at stake and uh, we want everybody to be healthy. Thank you. John Boyle. Yeah, Bobby, um, another one about you being a leader and a captain. There's a lot of young guys you guys are going to probably be counting on. You First round pick and, you know, you draft a couple defensive ends. How do you kind of help guys be ready? What do you tell them when they missed rookie minicamp? They missed OTAs. They, they didn't get all that experience yet. They're going to be counted on come September. Um, I think the biggest thing is getting in the playbook. I think you got to get in the playbook and, and learning to play. So I think, um, you know, trying to make myself available to help them learn the plays as much as we can. I think it's um, good for us to be able to have the acclimation period that we have, uh, be able to get out there on the field and, um, you know, I think a lot of the learning is, is done on the field. And so, um, you know, they're going to have to be ready. Um, they're professionals now. So, um, you know, I think the veterans and guys like myself and KJ, we're just going to have to do a really good job of making ourselves available so they can, um, you know, we can share our experience, our scars, and try to get them caught up as fast as we can. You mentioned KJ. He, he wrote that letter for the NFLPA. As a guy who was part of the lockout year, obviously different circumstances, but similar in the lack of offseason. Can he help those guys in a particular way? Yeah, definitely, because, you know, they didn't have an offseason, so he can provide some knowledge in what it was like um, back then when they didn't have that knowledge. And they kind of just got thrown into uh, the fire, per se, which I think he did a really good job. And so um, learning from a guy like that who's kind of been in a similar situation, and, you know, talk about how he handled that and how he went about it that way professionally, um, I think is, is great knowledge for, for the young guys. Aaron Levine. Hey, Bobby. Um, there was a report that Chance Warmack uh, had opted out this season and another bunch of other players have decided to do that. Have you had any indication um, from teammates who are strongly considering opting out or have opted out? And what is that decision making process like for yourself personally? Uh, I haven't spoke to anybody on our team uh, that's been considering opting out. I know it's a, a thing that um, a lot of people take serious because, like I said, this is a, a thing that we have not experienced. And uh, you have to think about more than just yourself in this situation. You have to think about your families. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that decided to opt out that have a family that live with them, a family that stay with them, uh, kids, uh, spouses that, you know, suffer from different conditions. And, um, you know, they have to be mindful of that. And so you have to respect the decision for uh, any decision they make, whether it's to play or not to play, um, you know, especially when it's centered around family. So, um, you know, I respect it. Um, I have, you know, decided to play. So, um, you know, here we go. Thank you. Maz Vida. Hey, Bobby. Hey, uh, just a question. Is there any systems uh, that you guys have set up to be in contact with the players um, in terms of, you know, what they're doing off the field safety-wise? I know you talked about it's everybody's responsibility, but is there, like, that everybody's got a list, they talk to that person, any systems in place like that? No, nah, we're not going we're not going to track grown men, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I think a lot of it is checking in. A lot of it is um, understanding, you know, the players that, you know, like to go out and things of that nature and really being mindful of that. But at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it's going to be a lot of self-discipline as well. Uh, you know, because you can have a bunch of leaders telling you the right things. You can have a bunch of people telling you the right things. You can even have people 
uh, following you and making sure you go home. But at the end of the day, you have to, you're going you to be by yourself at some point. And the decisions that you make by yourself, um, you know, is going to affect not just yourself and other people. So, you know, uh, a lot of it is, is just hoping that we have that discipline and we have the leadership to, uh, you know, help push that message. Uh, and so the message will be there. Uh, and it's up to everybody around us to follow those messages and be a little bit more disciplined this year. Kind of one non-football question. I know that football is important, but business is important to you as well. You've talked about how important it is for, for you to get young black men into the tech industry. How important is that for you to get them into that field? I think it's extremely important because I think it's um, something that if you look at the statistics, uh, we're, we're not really represented that well. And, and um, which is fine. I think it just takes more people to get in the doors and then bring people with them. So, um, you know, a lot of it is just getting in the door, understanding, uh, doing a great job at it and then bringing people along with you. So like you said, I'm kind of in the process of doing that. And so I'm excited about that. Thank you. Chris Francis. Hey, Bobby. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, Jamal uh, is such a dynamic player, and they moved him around a lot in New York. I'm curious um, how much the defense needs to change in Seattle, if at all, and uh, are you okay with all that? Uh, I don't think the defense needs to change. I think, um, uh, you know, he's going to come in and fit in just fine. Um, a lot of times there are certain defenses where we have the safety comes into the box, which I think he's very comfortable in. You know, a lot of times we have the safety come in blitz, which I think he's very comfortable in. So um, there's a lot of things that we do that really complements the game, his game. And there's a lot of things that uh, we do that we feel can bring another element out in this game. So I think uh, this defense should be really, really fun for him. And speaking of uh, kind of coming together, there's no preseason games. We, You already mentioned about the rookies. And you do have a lot of new faces on the team. Um, Benson and, and Bruce have been there. But um, – how 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 the how will the chemistry work here with just like throwing you into the fire on September thirteenth here? Uh, I'm you know I think as we get you know start to trickle down into the building and start to get on the field, I think a lot of that chemistry is going to be made uh, on the field. Uh, I think we've done the best that we can. See how we've done the best we can to kind of create that chemistry um, through Zoom and through uh, you know doing meetings like this, and so. Um, I feel like there's some chemistry being built, but I think the genuine chemistry is really built on the field. And so as we get on the field and as we get into different phases, I really feel like we can um, still build that and we have enough time to do that. Thanks, Bobby. Omar Ruiz. Hey, Bobby, good to see you. Good to see you too. Oh, I see you. Good. Okay. <laughs> my my offseason look might be coming down here pretty soon. Okay. Um, Chris kind of, asked uh, my question I guess the follow-up to that would be what would you consider maybe priority number one once you do hit the field to kind of build that chemistry uh that, that's my first question there uh I think it's just getting around the guys like you know you said um uh, I haven't been able to be around some of the the rookies that we've drafted some of the new guys that have been here that are coming back and so just being able to be around those guys is is I think priority number one because you get to get a feel for people and, you know, after that, it's, it's really just applying what we've learned uh, this whole offseason um, on the field, the little bit that we've been able to uh, understand about each other and just getting on the field and really starting to create that chemistry and start to understand uh, the people that we're playing with. And have you ch had a chance to speak with Jamal since the trade went down? Yeah, I, I spoke to him a couple times. So Okay. And then, and then one more time just for clarity, the, the, where did you meet him at it before? Like Monaco, you said? Uh, yeah, we were, um, I, I met him in the Pro Bowl, um, you know, one year, and then we were both on Brand Jordan. So, uh, you know, we've oh, yeah. taken some Good. trips together. So I got to learn and understand him a little more, too. So, Cool. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah. Shout out to Brand Jordan. <laughs> Jim Mueller. Bobby, we've talked about what having no off-season program means for the rookies and the newcomers, but how about for you? How did that affect you and where you are in your career? Uh, I actually feel like it's, it's, it was really nice uh, to be at the house and be able to be around family and, and really, um, you know, be with uh, my trainer a little bit longer and be able to read a little bit more. So it was a nice, uh, peaceful time 
you know, my body got to rest a little bit more, which is always great for me, not so great for the, the rest of the league. And so, um, you know, it was, it was a great time to, to be able to just get away from the game and be around family a little bit more, take care of your body a little bit more, take care of your mind a little bit more. And because of your experience, do you have a better idea of how to ramp up as you work up to a season where you don't have the normal preseason activities? Yeah, definitely, because I feel like, you know, throughout my career, I've had all types of experiences. I've had, you know, time where I've, I've played um, every preseason game and I have time where I play no preseason games. And so, um, you know, going to my ninth year, I feel like you have a pretty good understanding on how or what your body needs to, to kind of get going. Thanks, Bobby. No problem. Brady. Hey, Bobby, how's it going? Um, Looking back on last year and all of the base defense you guys ran, I, I know it wasn't different for you in the sense that I mean, you were on the field all three downs uh, usually, but was all the base that you guys ran, did that mean anything? Was, did that make life different for you in any way, just with more on your plate or anything like that? Um, I mean, like you said, from a, a scheme perspective, it wasn't really different, but from the way that teams were um, attacking our defense or trying to, uh, create different matchups. Um, it was definitely uh, something that took an adjustment and, you know, we felt like we adjusted throughout the season. And, uh, you know, I think for me, it was just, um, you know, something that was just different. And, you know, I learned as we got in the season and, you know, you adapt to things. I think as you get older, you have to be able to adapt and, you know, we we're in the process of doing that. And I've got one uh, kind of offbeat follow-up question. Uh, for however many days you, you've been back in the building, what is the uh, coolest looking mask and what's the most absurd looking mask that you've seen from any of your teammates? Um, everyone's kind of been pretty basic. Um, I think the, the worst mask that you can see is the one that doesn't fit the guy's face. When it just covers their nose and mouth and then you have like the chin and everything else hanging out. So we definitely have to make sure that we have masks that fits people's face. I think we are a uh, well-paid league to, to get that done. Who, who, who has an ill-fitting mask that you've seen? I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, throw anybody out the bus, man. So, I mean, there's pictures out there, so we got to do a little research. All right, thanks. All right, Nico Marino. Thank you. Uh, Bobby, uh, how uh, important is it going to be to be mentally ready for – the extra distraction of, you know, having to do the extra testings and, uh, you know, the possibility of uh, maybe isolation from certain players. That'd be my first question. Yeah, I think it's, it's a extremely important. I feel like this game is more mental than people think. And so as you add these different distractions, whether it's testing, whether it's, um, you know, the guys that have a chance to test positive, things of that nature, um, your mental has to be ready. And, um, you know, it's going to be throughout the whole season. You know, you're going to have um, stadiums where there's no fans. You're going to have stadiums where there are fans. You're going to have, you know, uh, a chance to travel to hot spots, things of that nature. And so uh, you mentally just have to be ready for anything. And I think, you know, this game has prepared you for that. Um, it's just this is a little bit different than, than what we've been used to these past years. And Thank you. And, and aside from the big acquisitions that teams had, there's still uh, some that are waiting for a, a big time pass rusher. Uh, what are your expectations on, on that? Do you expect that you have to go get somebody? And do you speak to uh, Clowney at all uh, these days? Do you have any insight on it? Um, I mean, if I had any, I don't know if I would share it. But uh, no, I haven't spoken to Clowney. I feel like, you know, that's he has a, a decision that he needs to make for his family and things of that nature. So, you know, a lot of times I just, you know, give people their space to make that decision and, you know, respect um, the decision that they're going to make for their families. And, uh, um, you know, I'm excited about Bruce and Benson being back. Uh, those guys each had a thing about eight plus sacks last year, uh, which I definitely feel is going to help our team. And so uh, we got a lot of young guys that are ready for opportunity to grow and it's going to be fun. Thank you for your time, Bobby. No problem. Curtis Crabtree. Hey, Bobby. I was just curious, without any preseason games, probably not going to be tackling guys to the ground once you get to that point. Do you have any sense that tackling could be an area where that might be a little bit shaky early on in the season as guys kind of readapt to that? And just with no preseason, is it somewhat like going back to college again, having the first game out of the gates count and the ramp up to that? Is there any contrast you can draw between that as well? 
Um, you know, I think there's a potential chance that, um, you know, tackling could be um, not as, as crisp as it is going into the season. But, you know, at the end of the day, I really feel like we are professionals. And, you know, I feel a lot of the tackling, especially the way um, the Seahawks go about it, we don't tackle. Uh, we don't ever do live tackling at practice. We don't do that. A lot of our tackling is mental. And you can get a lot of mental reps in. And, um, you know, that's always worked for us. And so that's kind of how we're going to approach it. As far as, like, college, it is like college. Um, you know, you just come in and, and you have to be ready to go. And everything counts. And so, um, you know, there you did a little bit more live tackling. Um, you know, I think we're, we're old enough and mature enough to, to figure out how to get a person down the ground. Thanks, Bobby. No problem. Good move. Hey, Bobby. Um, the last time we talked with you, that was the height of everything going on with social justice, Black Lives Matter. Um, among the team, you guys were having a lot of conversations. Have, have those conversations continued during the, you know, the last eight weeks or, or six weeks, whatever it's been? And have you guys had discussions about any sort of um, statement or, or actions you guys intend to take? Or do you expect those to kind of come up as camp's going on? Uh, I definitely feel like we've had a lot of conversations um, because I think since we spoke, it hasn't really calmed down. You know, there's still videos popping up every day of police brutality. There's still things popping up every day. And so, um, you know, the conversations around everything has been great. I think um, a lot of people are more conscious of things, but it, it hasn't really, um, you know, changed that much. And as far as your other question, I feel like a lot of the stuff that that we'll think about doing and things of that nature is stuff that I think you have to be around people, not really something that you can really handle over a phone. Um, phone is more of a conversation, but, you know, as far as actions and things of that nature, just how to go about everything um, is something I feel like you have to do in person because there's, there's so much going on. You know, you have uh, the social justice, police brutality, things of that nature, you know, and throw COVID on there as well. There's a lot of guys still trying to figure out how are they going to go about things with, with this going on. So um, I think there's a lot to figure out, a lot to uh, try to plan around. And, and I think we're going to figure that out as we go. Is it, is it possible to have those conversations when you're trying to socially distant and distance and, and keep the, the virus in mind? Yeah, I think it's possible. You might have to raise your voice a little bit more, but I mean, I think it's no different than uh, being on the field. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're able to have those conversations. Like I said, we're, a lot of us are mature, so. We'll, we'll get it done. Art Seal. Hey, Bobby. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, grown men. And uh, the Miami Marlins in Major League Baseball thought they had grown men, too. And now they have 16 positive tests. Uh, and I realize you don't know the details, but you probably saw the, the headlines of that. Did that give you any degree of apprehension since... since uh, yeah. MLB is operating the same way the NFL is uh, out of a bubble, allowing players to go home at night. Uh, does that, did, did that say, hey, wait, wait a minute, what are we doing? Uh, not really, because I have no idea what a baseball life looks like. I have no idea how um, a baseball, um, what they do in the dugouts, what they do at home, or what they do as far as those things. So I have no idea, one. Two, they're in the hospital, I believe. I think Florida is, is one of the growing uh, places that this thing is spreading. So, um, you know, so I, I really don't know um, about all that as far as a baseball standpoint. Um, I think, yeah, they got grown men, but obviously something go right. But um, the rest of the league is still fine. The rest of the league is still doing, doing fine. So I, I think um, seeing something like that, um, I think reminds guys, especially for the NFL as we start up, that, you know, it's going to take a lot of discipline to, to get this done. And anybody who doesn't take this seriously or, or isn't mindful um, of what's going on around them is susceptible of, you know, what happened over there. So, um, you know, that's, that's more of a, a – it's a lot of moving parts with that, you know, and, and it's a lot of things that I don't, I don't know. I know our protocols. I know what we got going on. I don't know what they got going on. I don't, I don't know. That could have been something that was done in the building. Uh, it could have been guys going out. I, I don't know the story, so I really can't uh, call it on that. But I'm, I'm, I feel like more positive that we'll have a little bit more discipline there. Thanks. Michael Sean. 
So Bobby, uh, as far as you know, being in the venture capitalist space now that you are um, on top of the, all the other business ventures that you've you know gone into over the course of your career, what's been the key to you know maneuvering in those spaces that's relatively unfamiliar territory, not only for an athlete, but someone that's a young black man like yourself? How have you been able to move in those spaces and get people to take you seriously? Um, I think a lot of it is just, uh, you know, track record. I think I, I've been in the VC space uh, for a while. I've been an angel investor for a while. I've um, been investing probably since 2013. Um, had some wins, had some losses. So far, more wins than losses. So, um, you know, I think a lot of that um, is great. To, to have, but I think a lot of it is just networking and understanding, um, you know, who are the top players in your city, who are the top players in other cities. Um, I think a lot of it is just um, learning and educating yourself on, um, you know, what to expect, things like that, and really understanding the business that you're trying to get into. Um, so it's not something I'm just throwing myself into. This is something that I've been uh, doing for a while. I've been uh, visiting different VC firms, different um, you know, organizations, different private equity funds since 2013. I've, I've been interning um, kind of basically since I've been in league. Um, I was interning at Ignition for the last three years. And so um, a lot of it is just doing the work. You know, a lot of people respect people that do the work. And so once you do the work, you have the respect. And then obviously there's some things you have to maneuver. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people respect the, the track record that I have. So um, you know, that was pretty, pretty good moving forward. I see you wearing the HBCU Foundation hoodie. Uh, now you repped the HBCUs all last year. Um, have you have you made any progress getting into a business school there or just because HBCUs are taking a hit, you know, with their sports programs because of COVID? Have you had any conversations there with maybe helping out either of those two things? Well, a lot of the stuff got shut down, um, you know, as we were trying to maneuver. So a lot of the stuff is being done online. So um, I was hoping to be able to get on the campus, but that, that probably is a ways away. Um, but as far as like helping, you know, we're, we're trying to figure it out and, um, we're trying to, you know, like you said, a lot of, a lot of them are taking hits and, um, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to, to kind of keep them afloat while this thing's going on. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, John Boyle, do you have a follow-up? I do. And Michael, Sean kind of set me up. Um, you've talked about the visibility for HBCUs and that being why you did that. We've, we've seen this summer. One of the top basketball recruits in the country picked Howard. I think the number one football recruit added Howard to his final list with, you know, Clemson, Alabama and all that. How encouraging is that for you to see young black men either picking those schools or very seriously considering them who are among the very top recruits? I think it's very important because I think, um, you know, I think there's a history there. Um, there, there used to be a, a lot of black athletes that chose those schools and, you know, we kind of went away from that. So to kind of see that, 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 come full circle and, and guys starting to consider it, um, I think it's amazing. You know, I think got, for like myself, like uh, when I was young, I, I, you know, I was from California. There wasn't too many HBCUs out there that was visible. And so I didn't really learn about it until I actually ironically got at Utah State. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of it is just visibility. A lot of it is just knowledge, understanding that is out there, understanding that's an option. And, you know, I'm, I'm I'm happy to see the, the the love that HBCUs have gotten this this uh, off season or these last few months. Bobby, thank you for joining, man. Appreciate hey, it. I got one more follow if uh, if you got time, Bobby. One more. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> um, last night you were named, you know, number thirteen in the top one hundred list. You know, wedged there between Drew Brees and and Tom Brady. As you enter year number nine, what does that recognition mean to you? Especially, you know, given that you don't necessarily promote yourself you know, like, like that. Um, so what did that, what did that recognition mean? I mean, I'm always grateful, man, especially uh, being acknowledged by your peers and, and seeing the way your peers re, uh, respect you and um, respect the way you play the game. It's always a, a, a very dope thing for me to be, you know, honored by those guys and kind of be wedged between those two guys. is probably pretty cool too, but um, you know, I respect everybody, man. I'm a, I'm a student of the game. I love the game. And, and I'm always grateful for my peers to, to respect the way I play the game. And, um, you know, heading into year nine, I'm, I'm not done. I have a lot more left. And I'm, I'm excited to get back out there and, and uh, prove a lot of people wrong. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you. Cool.
Appreciate it. Thank you. Good day. Thank you guys. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, Bobby.